please join me in welcoming His Grace Chaitanya Charan Das. Hare Krishna Prabhu, Dandavat Pranam. Hare Krishna, Dandavat. So, Thank you for the so invitation. Nice to have you. I also seen many of your shows and you, I also seen several of your shows <laughs> and you very candidly Krishna. address contemporary issues. And also I think your kirtan with your family is so beautiful. Oh. It is, shows the, the devotion of your heart, the devotion of your community, family. I'm grateful to be here today. Thank you. Only by the blessings of such Vaishnavas. So thank you so much for joining Prabhu. Um, uh, we're just so grateful uh, to have you. And I thought maybe we could just start with a brief intro just to you know get a connection of how, okay. why did you become yeah. a monk? <laughs> That's always a shocking life yes, decision yeah. for most people to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are multiple factors, but I would say the main factor was that I felt this was the best way I could contribute to society. Since my mm. childhood, I had a lot of faith in the power of education. So mm. I felt that through knowledge, I can change myself and I can change others. And uh, I was interested not just in theoretical knowledge, but more in applied knowledge. And that's why I chose engineering rather than science. And when I was studying in one of the mm -hmm. top engineering colleges in India, at that time, uh, I was also part of a social service organization where I, they were having various things, but I was interested in education. So I used to go to the slums and offer free tuitions for the kids over there. And I found that as they became friends with the kids, we realized that, that you know, they, they started speaking their hearts and they were from dysfunctional families, mostly because of alcoholic fathers and domestic violence. So I started thinking really what can, uh, what can um, knowledge of say geography or history or hmm. math help them in such situations? And so I felt that we need to do something more. We st so we started getting into, I uh, got some specialists to come and speak over there. We helped so many of the people over there get off alcohol. Uh, but mm -hmm. then there was a local municipal election and one of the candidates in order to woo the voters brought two truckloads of liquor and offered it free. Now, so not only mm -hmm. the fathers, but even the kids started drinking. Oh, and Krishna. that's when it struck me that Education may open doors externally, but there's something, open doors to a better life externally, but there's something mm. inside us which prevents us from walking through those doors. <laughs> so that was the time, something inside us. So that's what actually uh, made me start looking, exploring the inner world more. Mm. And then a friend gave me the Bhagavad Gita and I read in 336 that what is it that makes one act against one's own interests, even when one knows that one is acting like that? So I felt, yeah, this is such a relevant question. It was not mm. just that I had seen it in those people's lives. I had seen it around me, even in one of the top colleges, mm. there were students who were getting into drugs. One of the, mm. one of the toppers of our university was a chain smoker and he at that time got the highest paying job in the history of our college. But in six months he got lung cancer and within a year he died. So I re oh. realized that material education itself, material education itself doesn't really remove this inner demon, whatever it is from inside us. And it's not just out there. I was also known infamous for being quite short tempered at that time. So I also felt that I'm sabotaging myself. Mm. So when I started studying the Bhagavad Gita and then I started practicing the principles of Bhakti, I started especially chanting the holy names and fixing the mind on Krishna. I found myself getting transformed. One of my friends was a, brought up in a good family but was sliding into alcoholism. He also started practicing Bhakti and he also mm. became transformed. So I felt this is empowering. So then I, I had opportunities to go to America for studying. I had a veteran uncle who had his own company. He wanted me to come there and possibly become his successor. And I also got some good jobs in good MNCs in India. I decided to stay for some time, later go to America. So I was, while I was working, I was also sharing the wisdom of the Gita 
with others mm. so just informally giving talks in uh, hostel rooms and with students small groups so one evening i had a program uh, a bhagavad gita talk and i was working and my boss and i was a software engineer my boss told me today we have a urgent deadline uh, we, we you'll have to stay on and work i said no i have to, i have to go can we i just i'll do it later he said no you have to work so then i tried to get some other friends to if they could go for the talk but there hardly anyone who was there and who could go then that i stayed on that evening but then when i was coming back i thought that if i was not doing the software job there would be it's an important job it's a important india has made a mark in it i'm not minimizing software engineering but what mm-hmm. i felt was if i was not doing this there would be 100 other people who would take up this job but if i am not right. teaching the bhagavad gita how many people are there to do that mm. so i felt that studying and sharing this wisdom could be a greater contribution so and especially greater in the sense that not many people were doing that so for me mm. the bhagavad gita is not so much a religious book as a book for personal transformation and wow. i am still on that journey but writing the dandan gita studying the gita sharing the gita i feel we can all it can make us a uh, make us all better human beings so one of my websites is the sci- spiritual scientist so i often say mm-hmm. that science can make the outer world better spirituality can make the inner world better and we need wow. both so that's in brief that's well wow. that is a wonderful in-depth uh, view as to why we would actually take this seriously uh, it's very very inspiring because many many people would have chosen uh you know money money is the honey <laughs> the spiritual transformation is nice so long as it doesn't impinge on my material enjoyment that's usually the imbalance so and, and i find that that might be the crux of where this this idea of dharma comes in how can we choose dharma over our own lower needs lower um consciousness over ourselves So if we could maybe just uh, okay. you know dive straight in from there what is dharma to begin with why do we need it Okay So now the word dharma is famously multivalent it has many different meanings So the commonly known meanings are dharma is religion like we have hindu dharma we have various christian dharma that is one way in which the word is used which is also one valid usage but that is not the only usage another word of meaning of dharma is duty that this is my dharma so parents take care of the children when children uh, children grow up they they have their dharma to take care of their parents like that that could be a dharma dharma can be for to duty uh, in the bhagavad gita when krishna asks pruchami tvam dharma sammudha cheta i want to know what is my dharma i am bewildered he is basically asking what is the right thing to do so mm-hmm. you could say dharma can also be translated as the right thing to do it could be mm-hmm. now going deeper we want to say dharma if it comes from the root dri dri means to sustain so dharma is the activity which sustains us the activity that enables us to be who we are so in that right. sense we don't really choose dharma over ourselves it is rather by choosing mm. dharma we become ourselves we become wow. the fullest manifestation of who we are by dharma so dharma is not a set of religious rituals and it's certainly not a set of don't do this and don't do that and don't do this so yes there are some pleasures mm. which we do need to abstain from but then that is required for any activity in life if there's athlete that athletes they have to have a strict regimen they re- they re- regulate their diet they do so much discipline mm. so that they can be good athletes so in in our, in any field to become something worthwhile there are some things we abstain from but what dharma is about is that so i want to sacrifice so i'll just introduce one concept so i said the word dharma has many meanings the bhagavad gita talks about three modes there is sattva mm-hmm. rajas and tamas goodness passion and ignorance so can goodness can be associated with clarity and passion with energy and ignorance with apathy Mm, apathy, so right. apathy i don't care about anything mm. apathy energy and clarity broadly speaking right so one way to understand these three modes is that you can say 
some people make things happen some people watch things happen and some people wonder what happened wonder mm. what happened so mm. that's goodness passion and ignorance for you right so broadly we could say dharma in this context is what that where sattva guides and regulates rajas and tamas sattva mm -hmm. regulates and guides rajas and tamas so we have clarity and then we direct our energy and right. you know apathy is not always a bad thing because if we are if we start getting affected by everything that happens around us we will be overwhelmed to some extent we have to turn mm -hmm. off we have to tune off mm -hmm. for example sleeping you know if we kept being worried about all the th things that could go wrong in our life will not be able to sleep so even mm -hmm. the tamoguna is not a bad thing if there mm -hmm. were no tamoguna we would not be able to sleep to some extent when we go mm -hmm. to sleep we are apathetic about what is happening around us and that right. is required but the key is what is in dominating is it apathy that is dominating and defining a person is it simply energy or is it clarity so dharma mm -hmm. is that situation when when energy and apathy are guided by clarity okay this is what i'm going to focus on and this is what i'm not going to focus on so so wow. then what this means is dharma is those set of activities that help us those set of activities that help clarity to become stronger and then guide energy mm -hmm. and apathy accordingly so this is wow. one more meaning of dharma now you could go at a higher level dharma culminates in bhakti so dharma at mm -hmm. one level is being who we are mm -hmm. but at our core we are also spiritual beings and we are parts mm -hmm. of the supreme spiritual being so we could say the para dharma that the culmination the summit of dharma the shrimad bhagavatam says is bhakti so mm. it says it says dharma that says that the multi level meaning and mm. at a operational level at the level we, we were discussing today is that say if a person is attacked a basic right of all living beings is to live to survive and mm -hmm. to practice what they believe so if that is not being allowed mm. that is also dharma being violated so in one mm -hmm. sense dharma is a very universal concept it is not a sectarian concept at all it is it talks about right. essential our essential nature and how we can live in harmony with that wow wonderful uh so i i really like your your um you know vision of dharma being clarity what you're sharing so with that in mind um clarity is something that i think is probably possibly uh at the heart of what we're lacking as a community uh you know how should we move forward because it seems on one hand we're like we're getting you know very angry uh we have a lot of anger we've lot a lot of hurt within us how do we not transform that back how do we not reflect that back on others how do we not become violent and hurtful in response because on the one hand sure we've got uh, dharma rakshati rakshitaha right so dharma protects yeah. those who protect dharma so we we have a duty we have a duty as such that we must protect dharma but if how to gain that clarity that you speak of of um how to move forward okay yeah. yes now when we talk about clarity it is important that we understand that every person is an individual so while at one level each of all of us are human beings and we could say as human beings there are some fundamental things which we all need and share and beyond that each one of us is an individual so there are some there are some generic duties generic expectations generic things which we do and there are some specific individual things so mm -hmm. in this specific context if we consider in the in the tradition in the vedic tradition there were two primary guides and protectors of society there are brahmanas and kshatriyas so mm -hmm. the we could say broadly speaking the brahmanas focus more on clarity and less on energy not that the brahmanas lack energy but their focus is on gaining inner clarity and sharing that inner clarity with others so brahmanas they have you could say spiritual power or inner power and kshatriyas they have more energy than clarity then they their the rajas is little more than sattva 
So, but their rajas is balanced by the Brahmana's guides. So, these two together are considered to be the two key limbs of the body. See, a body needs various parts. The, if mm -hmm. somebody is attacking us, we need eyes to see, okay, where I'm being attacked from, what I'm going to do, why am I being attacked. To make sense of things, we need eyes. So, the, mm -hmm. the eyes and the intelligence with which the eyes are associated, that refers to the, that is like the Brahmanas. And the arms are like the Kshatriyas. So, the whole body is like a society. So we need both. So Brahmanas right. are they what they guide through Shastra, through through scripture, scriptural knowledge, through wisdom basically. And the Kshatriyas they they guide and protect through Shastra, through weapons. So basically, mm. we need both. We need both. We need both. So now that is a reality. We cannot deny That's that. A reality. Yeah, of course, we do need both. Now, with respect to anger, there are two extremes. See, one is we think of anger is always as bad. That's not true. Anger indicates that we care. Mm -hmm. And in, in one sense, if terrible things happen to someone and we don't feel any, any anger about it, then the, we, see there are different words. There is the word outrage. That's outrageous. What do we mean? Mm. That's, that's so objectionable that I'm feeling inflamed by it. So outrage in one sense is good. If we don't feel angry about certain things, then that means we don't care at all. So the emotion of anger itself is not bad. In one sense, you could say no emotions are intrinsically bad. It is only when an emotion takes control of us, that's when it can become bad and put sidelines everything else. So there is, as we could say that we have three levels of being. There's the body, there's the mind and there's the soul. So the body broadly, we can, sorry, the mind, we can associate with emotions, the body with actions and the soul is what makes decisions. Soul associated with the wow. intelligence is what makes decisions. Mm -hmm. So emotions right. will naturally arise. Now from those emotions, there are, in, there are contemplation, there's a decision that is made and then the actions come up. So feeling anger at such times, I would say it's not only not wrong, it's actually wrong if we don't feel anger. Hmm. However, if we let anger control our actions, then what is happening is that clarity is being sidelined and then rajas and tamas take control. So mm. we may do some things that hurt ours, hurt others more. We may complicate the problem further. We will make the things worse. So, right. so what does it mean in this context that yes, there is, uh, there is, there is brutality in the world. In the Bhagavad Gita talks about how all of us have a dark side inside us. We, we could say there is a part of us that is wise, and there is another part of us that is otherwise. Is the part of us that is wise and another part that is otherwise and this mm. otherwise part can not only be unwise it can be it can be cruel it can be evil it can be wicked, brutal it can degenerate to those levels now that is there within everyone in some right. people in some people this part this asuri part becomes extremely dominant and then they mm. can behave in horrible ways so generally, just going back to the earlier point of Shastra and Shastra, so what the Brahmanas do is they nourish the wide, wise part within us through wisdom, through, in, through, through culture, through guidance. By the wise part becomes stronger and that wise part acts like an inner sensor. It keep, it's like it's our conscience, which prevents mm -hmm. the unwise part, the otherwise part from taking control of us. Mm -hmm. But not everyone is going to listen to the Brahmanas. Mm -hmm. So those who yeah. are going to let their otherwise part, their dark side, control them, those who don't care for wisdom, those who don't care for others, for them, the Kshatriyas are essential. Mm. So we could say the Brahmanas, they proffer education and the Kshatriyas, they offer discipline, they offer correction. They, that's why they need Shastra. So right. what we need to do is that... When somebody's dark side has come out so much that they're not ready to listen, they're not going to listen to any good advice, then Kshatriyas are required to fight. And sometimes that is the only voice that is heard. 
So, right. but the challenge is that if we start thinking that out there is there are there is evil, there are dark people, and I want to destroy them. Okay, but the problem in doing that is we start thinking, that, okay, I am destroying the dark, dark the, the terrible people out there, and in doing that, I can do whatever I like because those people mm -hmm. are terrible. Mm -hmm. But then what is happening is even if I succeed in destroying those terrible people. I am nourishing the the otherwise side within me. I am giving free way to the dark the side within the rajas and tamas within me, and mm -hmm. therefore, I will may end up becoming the a reflection of what I was sought out to end. So therefore, the brahmanical side has to guide. So mm -hmm. yes, there are we can talk specifically about what could be done in the situation, but a simple idea is idea of vigilante justice or just. Hitting back and destroying those people. Those people may be a particular nationality, a particular religion, a particular demographic group. You know, so what happens is, Rajas alone doesn't have clarity. So Rajas mm -hmm. go the mode of action goes for just blanket solutions. Now, all those people are bad. All those people mm -hmm. are terrible, and we just destroy all of them. So that mm -hmm. that clarity, identify the problem and to address it, that is very much required. Right. So um, that's really profound that we, we obviously both need, you know, two, two parts of the railway to move progress smoothly ahead. But um, in ISKCON, we obviously train people to be Brahmanas. And, uh, mm. you know, I don't really see how, how, where, in an ideal situation, how would we be training the Kshatriyas uh, so that they don't become just vigilante, you know, justice warriors yes. or keyboard warriors so is there a, 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 an even in an ideal situation how would we go about training real kshatriyas first of all how would we do that and what is a real kshatriya so what what, what are the qualities because obviously it's described okay. in the gita that it's not just you know compassion is a quality of a kshatriya <laughs> so how would we uh, reconcile what is it in your life that would manifest to show you that you are a kshatriya and that you are worthy of picking up arms and using shastra uh, as opposed to shastra. Okay. So the Gita states that in 1843, So what it is saying is that basically for each one of us, there are multiple aspects to being a Kshatriya. So, Shauryam, Shauryam is heroism, valor. Then, Tejo is power, energy, power. Then, Dhruti is determination. Kshatriyas can persist through great difficulties also. Then, Daksham mm -hmm. is important, it's expertise or resourcefulness. And then, there is Yudhe Chapya Apalayanam, that one doesn't run away when there is a fight. Apalayanam, not Danam, giving charity. And now Ishwara Bhava, here it doesn't refer to God, it refers to leader. They have a le the ability to lead others, take other people along the way. So while I said earlier that Kshatriyas, they use Shastra and Brahmanas use, Shast sorry, Kshatriyas use Shastra and Brahmanas use, use Shastra. That, that's, that's a simplified understanding. It's not that mm -hmm. the warriors or the Kshatriyas are always fighting. That's one aspect. Mm -hmm. They have the strength, they have the heroism. They, they are ready to fight, but they are also resourceful. Daksham. If you consider even an ordinary life, if you consider the police or we consider the military, especially if you consider the police, they are not always fighting criminals in the sense that they're not always you know, in gunfights or something like that. Mm. Right. Normal administration is also a part of Kshatriya responsibility. Uh, so mm -hmm. in today's world, it's not Kshatriya is, is not just uh, the 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 defense or the police even administration is a part of kshatriyas so the heads of mm -hmm. state they are also they are also meant to be kshatriyas especially after the first world war as weapons started becoming more and more sophisticated so basically diplomat right. pol political leaders and military leaders started becoming completely separate if you look at mm -hmm. that before napoleon and others napoleon would himself fight but if you mm. consider the Second World War, practically none of the leaders, whether it is of Germany or UK or America, 
they, none of them were actually in the military fighting. Mm -mm. So there, there has been the separation in today's world between the, the politicians and the military. But both are aspects of Kshatriyas. So that means mm -hmm. that force is sometimes necessary for a solution. But force is not the only way to solve a, solve a problem. The When mm -hmm. Krishna goes as Shanti Dut, then he uses four strategies. Sam, Dham, mm -hmm. Bhed and Danda. So Sam is Sam is like likeness. Show similarities. You know, we all we both share similar interests. And mm -hmm. it's not neither's interest to fight. So this is also a Kshatriya. Right. It is not just like intellectual, oh, we are all all human beings. That's abstract. No, we share mm. share practical interests in the world. Sam. Then there is Dham. Dham means that in terms of it is that if you do this, this is the reward that is there for you. Mm. Then bhed. You know, if you don't do this, basically the idea is create dissensions. Create dissensions mm. between the in the opposition. If you don't do this, these are the problems that are going to come. Because you are making a bad decision, not everyone on your side will also go with you. Mm. And there will be division. So actually, then be, then danda is the last means. That is, use weapons. So Kshatriya needs to be resourceful to be good at all these things. Sam, Dham, Bhed and Danda. And use appropriate. So when Krishna went as a peace messenger, first he told, he addressed Dhritarashtra, he addressed Duryodhana and he said, both the Pandavas and Kauravas are of the same dynasty. And right. they share the same blood and they both can live prosperously. Why do we need to fight? You can have their, your kingdom, you can let them have their kingdom. Then when that didn't work, he talked about Dham. He said that, okay, you want a greater kingdom? You, you keep majority of the kingdom, just give the Pandavas five, five villages. This is what you can get if you have peace. Then he said, if you don't do mm. this, you know, because of you, Duryodhana, because of his obstinacy addressing the court, he said that everybody will be killed. Mm. Thousands and thousands of people will be killed. And Krishna's speech was so persuasive that temporarily when Dushasan was always like, Duryodhana's right hand man, and he got affected and he said, no. He said, if yes. Duryodhana doesn't listen to Krishna, let us all tie him up, arrest him and hand him over to Krishna. Uh, Krishna. Mm. So of course, that was just a moment of goodness that Dushasan had. Afterwards, again, he submitted to Duryodhana. But that is Bed. Mm. And then mm. there is Danda. So in today's context, so we could say uh, 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 advocacy and diplomacy are something which is very much required. What you talked earlier mm. about Hindus, broadly speaking, not being united. Because of that, mm -hmm. we don't have a voice. Now you also exactly. mentioned that uh, in the media, negative things about us come much about us come much more than positive, or like how we are bad people. Then bad things happening to us don't come. But if some one person mm -hmm. in a billion people does something bad, that will come prominently. Now there is definitely bias. This, yeah, that's bias. It's true, but there are two ways of looking at this. See, one is. Mm -hmm that those people are bad. It is easy to presume malevolence. Malevolence is that those people are bad. But a much more, you could say, reasonable or probable explanation is not malevolence, but ignorance mm -hmm. or incompetence. Ignorance mm -hmm. or when somebody does something terrible, it could be because they're out to hurt yes. us. Yeah, mm -hmm. so in my understanding, here it's, it's incompetence on our parts because we mm -hmm. have never, we have never as a Hindus, as a group, have never thrown around our weight. Now, Hindus are among the uh, wealthiest minorities in the Western world. Uh, in mm -hmm. America, we are among the wealthiest minorities, I believe in UK also. And they, so we don't lack in numbers, we don't lack in money, but we lack in cohesion. Right. So because of yeah. that, what happens is that's incompetence on our parts. Now, I'm not just saying we lack in cohesion in that sense. Often, Exactly. We also don't, don't consider these issues as important till something comes up. So, for example, right. how, if you consider Hindus as uh, we want our children to become doctors and engineers, which are individual lucrative fields, but they are not socially influential fields. Now, Jews are mm -hmm. a far smaller minority than us, but Jews have consciously focused on entering into fields that mold public opinion. So mm -hmm. if there is no one representing our side, 
well did we send somebody from our side to be there or not right. so it could be incompetence on our side and it could be ignorance mm -hmm. from their side so mm -hmm. in one sense you could say that uh, the atrocities against Bang in bangladesh were were not a new event it has been happening it would be like a slow genocide that is happening but yes. right now at least some news came why mm -hmm. because it's on is an international organization and there was some leverage that ISKCON could put by having demonstrations all over the world. And ISKCON is yes. relatively better connected than many other groups. So we had some contacts with the media. Right. So at least some coverage mm -hmm. came. So right. I would say that, now I'm not saying that the media is not biased, but mm -hmm. that, uh, let's not get into that discussion or let's not obsess over that without considering our part in it. It could be mm -hmm. that we have been incompetent in advocating the importance of Hindu human rights, the advocating human advocacy of human Hindu concerns. And it could be that the people over there are just ignorant. So I think I agree. presuming ignorance and incompetence is a better way to move forward than presuming malevolence. When bad things are done by people, it could be that they are evil, but it could also mm. be that maybe something else going on over there. They don't know what the problem is and we haven't communicated the problem to them. Right. So I, I, I can respect that we're that not assuming malevolence. So just to complete this. So, a more, huh. Go ahead. So just to complete, sorry, to complete this is that. That's why if we see malevolence, then the only solution is bhed. Sorry, danda. Uh -huh. Sam, dam, danda, bhed. The only solution is if I see malevolence, then I have to destroy. But if I don't That's jump to the conclusion of malevolence, then Sam, dam, Sam, dam and bhed also we can use. Okay. So, and we are in, as an influential right. group, you know, we share many concerns with mainstream society and we can exert influence. So I think Sam, Dam, Bhed are also very important. So I, I would I would agree with you on that, that Sam, Dam, Bhed are important on a normal, uh, you know, mm. our generic progress forward as Hindus. That would be, that yes. would make sense. But when clearly there is malevolence in, in, I'm talking about in extreme situations such as Bangladesh or, you know, in Kashmir, yes. and there's, there's lots of, there's lots of actual uh, point of no return. You know, we've crossed that point where yeah. uh, you can't really be uh, communicating. Communication, all communication is lost in one sense because there's yes. just uh, there's no the scope for it. In that situation, wouldn't we truly need what would be the dund version of uh, you know a dharmic dund version? Would do we do we where do we stand on that as ISKCON, as Vaishnavas, as um, a Hindu society? Because the more I hear uh, the, the Hindutva narrative, you know, the Kattar Panthi narrative, the more the West resists it and thinks that we are all just right wing extremists as well. So th there's this very, um, you know, interesting dynamic that the more we become, uh, you know, inclined for dand, the, this. Uh, violent approach in the end, uh, it seems like it's just going to be more and more divisive uh, and maybe alienate yeah. us from the broader support that Sam, Dam, and what was the third one, would, would might be, be. Uh, help us, be. Yeah. right? Because we want that, we want diplomacy and uh, advocacy, but if we take on this Dund approach in any space, whether it be Bangladesh or Kashmir, immediately we get so much backlash that uh, then the other three approaches might not have a chance. So I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing ideas okay, out there. Yeah, I, what I, I, would... yeah, I appreciate that point. That That's true. See, one thing is that uh, because of various reasons, uh, including, I would say, ignorance and incompetence, not, uh, not restricted to that, but the, any kind of Hindu activism is immediately acti is, uh, equated with Hindu right-wing fanaticism. Mm -hmm. That That's just, in today's mainstream media, that is just the unfortunate reality. So, so if we are, yeah, so if, if, we are, if we are going to live in fear of that, then we will never be able to stand up for ourselves. So we will we will just uh, be there is a time as you said when danda is required now to take from draw from our own tradition itself uh, when Srila Prabhupada 
was establishing ISKCON at that time at two places in Mayapur, which is our international headquarters, and Mumbai, which Shila Prabhupada considered one of his most important projects in Juhu, the economic mm -hmm. financial capital of India. At both the places, uh, devotees faced physical attacks. You know, there were decoits. Uh, that now, whether they were ide religiously, ideologically motivated or not, but they came to plunder. They came to desecrate. And then the devotees had guns. And they used those guns. And Prabhupada appreciated that. That this is Kshatriya, we have to do this. Of course, they're done in self-defense. Initially, the narrative was spun as if the devotees were aggressors and there was some problem, but eventually things uh, came back to right. So it's not that Prabhupada was in principle not recognizing the need for Kshatriya approach. Similarly, when the Juhu temple was being threatened, one of the life members, very prominent supporters, he said, I have been in the army. He says, if you try to stop the construction of this temple, I'll come here with my gun. And he stood guard with him and his son uh, all night. And then when Prabhupada heard about it, Prabhupada said, yes, he's a Kshatriya. So Prabhupada appreciated that. So now we can say as a movement, ISKCON is 50, 60 years old. We started in 1965 and it really took off in 1970. So about 56 years, 55 years of 1966 onwards. So we are not that big a movement. And our focus has been primarily on creating a Brahminical culture, centered on creating Brahmanas, which is very mm -hmm. important in society. Absolutely. But at the same time, Kshatriyas are also important. So now if we ourselves, I would say the three things, the three ways which we can work. One is that those who are existing, those who are in the moment, some of them themselves get Kshatriya training. Mm -hmm. Some of them themselves get self-defense training. And in fact, that is quite often necessary. Now, almost all temples mm -hmm. do have certain level of security. Now, of course, we may hire outside people, but there are devotees also who oversee that security. So that is right. some of us, those who are already devotees, some of them learn some Kshatriya skills if they have those inclinations. Second is that those who already have Kshatriya inclinations, we focus on cultivating them so that they become devotees and they use their Kshatriya tendencies in a devotional way. And the third is those groups who are already Kshatriya groups, Kshatriya kind of groups. Now we have a healthy relationship with them by which is that when we, when we are in danger, they'll be there to help us. Mm -hmm. So various approaches are being considered and and I think during this time, there has been a lot of awakening. So yes, there are some situations, as you rightly said, when when Sam Dam Bhed, that point of discussion and negotiation is gone. So mm -hmm. what we need is, is to be ready for using the danda also. So right. in my understanding, danda here is more of deterrence. 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 That if you do this, this is what is going to happen. We also can hit Have back. Not that we have to hit back. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, but we can hit back. It's more of justice. It's more of deterrence. So that is required. Right. There is that famous story of Absolutely. Narad Muni. He once told he once told a snake that you know why are you killing people like this? So don't kill. And mm -hmm. he said okay. Then he became very timid and tame. And one day Narad Muni was passing mm -hmm. by, and this snake was completely bruised. So bruised mm -hmm. and battery says some small kids were torturing it and beating it up. So what happened? He says, you told me not to bite. Now every, everybody is tormenting me. He says, I told you don't bite, but I didn't tell you don't show your fangs. I didn't tell you don't hiss. Now you have to act for deterrence. So basically right. the Kshatriya approach is not ruled out. It is essential in society. That's what the point I was mm -hmm. making through this. I appreciate that. So, so this uh, this comment is quite relevant in the sense that most people, as soon as, because what you're describing is basically, uh, a lot of the push for Hindutva, you know, and 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 maybe having an Indian, um, a Hindu Rajya, right? Like we uh, seems to be people awakening to the hour, of, a need of the hour, and saying that, okay, we stand up for dharma now. This is it, there's enough. We 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 have uh, experienced enough betrayal and violence, and uh, uh, you know now we are going to stand up for ourselves. But as soon as I use this word Hindutva, especially in the West, because I live in the UK, I get a lot of flack for it. <laughs> Immediately, it's assumed that it's a radical uh, stance. And that's not where 
I, I really feel like we need to have a dialogue so that we can understand that there is a difference between standing up for ourselves and then just being extremely um, fanatic in our view that Hinduism is the only way. That's not, uh, so I think it segues into the idea that uh, what is this stance, the Vedic stance of a secular nation? Are we okay. meant to, as Hindus, are we secular? And can we okay. withstand, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very important okay. question. See, uh, see, uh, uh, see, first of all, Hinduism can never say that it is the only way because Hinduism doesn't offer only one way. Hinduism itself is offers a multiplicity of paths. Like Krishna says, Ye thamam prapadyante tham sathayva bhajamyaham. Mama vartamanu vartante manushya partha sarvasha. He says, as all people reciprocate with, approach me, I reciprocate with them accordingly. I reward them. And he says, all right. people are on my path. So we could say the broad teaching of the Bhagavad Gita is, I try to, I phrase it as, you know, from your place, at your pace, access God's grace. Hmm. From your place, at your pace, access God's grace. So it's universal. Hmm. So in that sense, that very idea that we can have only, this is the only way that is alien hmm. to Hinduism. That is not at all right. the case. So, so having said that, now there is going to be certain, sometimes we have to look at words and some words just acquire a negative connotation. So hmm. for example, Srila Prabhupada used the word cult. The cult of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is spreading all over the world. At that mm -hmm. time, cult didn't have a negative connotation. But right. now, but now cult it has a very negative connotation. So at that right. time, cult was simply a group. It was simply mm -hmm. a group. It is a, but now it is it conveys a very cloistered group of somebody who is controlling and close brainwashing. Uh -huh. Yeah, close it's close-mindedness. Yeah. So then best we avoid that language, we avoid that usage. So whether we use the specific word Hindutva or not, in particular contexts, that is something which we have to be careful. If the word is going to bring out, just make people put us into a particular mental category and close mm -hmm. down the discussion, then the word needn't be used. We can avoid using it temporarily. Now what happens is sometimes people say we are not criticizing Hinduism, we are only criticizing Hindutva. But then all Hindu activism, all Hindu standing for rights is is called as Hindutva only. Then what is left of Hinduism is nothing except you do some rituals in your home and you let us do everything and control everything. Whatever we want. Mm -hmm. That's not going right. to work. So, so in my understanding, equating Hindutva with extremism, mm -hmm. that is simply like a very cunning strategy by which all of Hindus are put down. So Hindutva is equated right. with extremism and all Hindu activism is equated Hinduism. Therefore, all right. Hindu activism, all Hindu act advocacy is labeled as extremism and is put down. It is at least given a bad name. So mm -hmm. it is a difficult situation to be in. So whether we use a particular word or not, the point is that mm -hmm. we need to recognize that we are going to stand up for our rights. And there are some simple right. facts. If, if Hindutva, say if the current government is set to be the Hindutva government, okay, we may, okay, even if you agree with that for the argument's sake. But India is the only country uh, in the immediate vicinity, you can say India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, put Sri Lanka aside, Bangladesh, we consider Pakistan. India is the only country in that area where the percentage population of the minorities has increased. Exactly, exactly. There's Pakistan, no the percentage it. of the minorities has decreased. Bangladesh, the percentage of minorities has decreased. So if there is such, uh, such Hindutva extremism in India, uh, then uh, how would the percentage of minorities be increasing? Put aside exactly. everything else, occasional flare-ups and riots, put aside all everything else. So if we start with raw data, then there is clear evidence that the minorities are flourishing. If you consider cricket, uh, there are so many right. Muslims who have been, Muslims and even Christians, who have been in the Indian cricket team? Now, how many Hindus have been there in the Pakistani cricket team? How many Hindus have been there right. in the Bangladeshi cricket team? You may say that their population is very small. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason why it's so small. Out of 11 players, can't one player be there? No, there's only one yeah. player and he had so much abuse that he left in Pakistan. Bangladesh has never had anything like that. So who is discriminating? 
who is discriminating yeah. so i think rather rather than fixating on labels which make people aggressive and make us put us on the defensive we all can avoid the labels and focus on the facts right. so i really appreciate now, that yeah so labels sometimes create negative uh, negative vibes so now coming mm. to secularism see again secularism is like i said dharma has many meanings so secularism can also have many different meanings mm -hmm. but at a basic level if we how did the idea of secularism start that now there are many different understandings of it but let's take one understanding of secularism is that is the idea of separation of state and religion the separation mm -hmm. of state and religion and that you know, that people should be able to practice their own faith mm -hmm. and right the, the state should not impose any particular faith on anyone now that was the basic idea so that so now if we consider this as basic secularism the separation of uh, state and religion now what is religion religion is about whom one worships what what uh, what conception of ultimate reality one has and the mm -hmm. state is considered with law it is considered with uh, it's concerned with maintaining basic welfare in society Mm -hmm. so if we consider this dynamic that there is a uh, law the state's purview is to protect law and religion's purview is to guide in faith right mm -hmm. faith traditions so then even in the vedic tradition we could say that there is this dynamic of dharma and bhakti so rather than equating religion with dharma from the vedic perspective religion would be more equated with bhakti bhakti so dharma is as i said earlier it's more of duty it's more of harmony so dharma would mean mm -hmm. it is law and order so if you consider mm -hmm. the, often the bhagavad gita is said to have been spoken before a dharma yuddha a dharma yuddha mm -hmm. it is a, it is a war of dharma but a very it's very it's something is a very overlooked fact that it is not that it was a set of it was it was basically a fight against wrong doers the kauravas had done many wrongs to the pandavas and they had grabbed their kingdom and they were not ready to return the kingdom significantly mm -hmm. on both sides there were people who worshiped different deities so right. it was not vaishnavas against some it was not against krishna bhaktas or vishnu bhaktas against some other bhaktas so bhishma no. on the side of the kauravas was a vaishnava and then mm -hmm. Bhurishrava was a Vaishnava. Drupada mm -hmm. on the Pandava sides was primarily a Shaivite. Drupada's Achha. family duty was Shiva. So mm. here we see that the the point is that it was not a it was not a religious war religious in the sense war. which we would use it today. It is not a religious exactly. war. It was basically it is not that. See, there is this concept of the uh, you could say. religion as is understood in the west in the abrahamic traditions is considered mm -hmm. with concerned with non believers or disbelievers hmm wrong, disbelievers mm -hmm. or wrong believers so the muslims may call us call hindus as kafirs or anybody who is not a muslim as kafir the christians mm -hmm. may call others as pagans so this is concerned with yeah. wrong belief but or mm -hmm. non believers right. or disbelievers but the bhagavad gita was or the, the kurukshetra war was not mm -hmm. fought against non believers per se it was fought against wrong doers right duryodhana was a, a wrong doer so it's a nuanced but Krishna, very powerful difference a very powerful wrong doer is something which is uh, which is uh, a law and order issue see krishna did not tell duryodhana you become my devotee and we will settle this issue mm. he didn't demand that right. from him he said just give the kingdom back yeah. so it was mm -hmm. not a war of beliefs it was a it was a more of a law and order issue so right this difference between dharma and bhakti that itself creates the foundation for secularism within the vedic context that even when right. yudhishthir became the king yudhishthir became the emperor of the world but that doesn't mean that all the kings under him leave alone all the kings who were under him even all his citizens that didn't mean he mm -hmm. imposed vaishnavism on all of them no. no that was his 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 preference his choice his worshipable deity was vishnu krishna and he worshiped and he was not he was not you could say abashed about it 
He was not shy about it. He was quite mm. openly worshipping Krishna. Mm. And right. that's why he offered Krishna the Agra Puja, the worship of the position of being the most foremost, foremost person in during his coronation in the Pushpa, in mm -hmm. the uh, Raja Suya Yagya. But mm -hmm. he was not imposing really his 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 bhakti on others. See, no. bhakti is a matter of personal choice. Mm -hmm. But dharma is a social necessity. Law and order wow. is not a matter of personal choice. Mm -hmm. now, whether I worship a particular deity or not, that's up to me. Mm -hmm. But if I drive drunk on the road, that's not a matter of personal choice. Because I'm right. harming others. <laughs> so, right. so this difference is very important. So in that sense, the Vedic teachings are inherently secular because right. they allow different people to worship different deities and there's no imposition mm -hmm. of faith. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in that sense, we could say that long before the idea of secularism came either in Europe or America, depending on what definition of secularism you use, but mm -hmm. it's actually secularism was already inherent within the Within the Vedic, the Hindu, teachings, Vedic context. Right. Exactly. Mm. But the problem is, is, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. No, you're saying something Finish. you can complete. Well, I oh, just please. thought uh, that, that I think because what you're expressing is so nuanced, I don't think most people would have picked up that there's a clear difference between religion and doing the right thing, just a societal, yes. uh, you know, law and order. So I, I think most people are, are confusing the fact that actually these two uh, are the same thing. This is just uh, if you're not, um, you know, the secular idea in India is is difficult when confronted with violence along the borders. You know, you got Kashmir and Pakistan, Bangladesh, and we're, we're constantly being attacked. It, it is seen as a religious um, issue as opposed to just um, fighting against straight up uh, unacceptable behavior like so I, I suppose my question is okay we understand that that the Vedic concept is secular you know the, it's not a religious um, uh, nation it's not it's not imposing religion dharma is not a position of religion I understand that point you're making but what then what would dharma be when we are being attacked like this okay what yeah. would be the dharma um, Yes, I think that's I agree. my question. I understand your question. Yeah. So again, the problem I said the difference between dharma and bhakti comes up because in Hindi, in the vernacular languages, dharma is associated with religion. Dharma mm. is associated with religion. It is not associated with ethics or duty or anything like that, and certainly not with nature. So, but this mm. principle, I think, it is well understood. Even the, in the history of India, there were at different times some kings with Krishna Dev Raya was a Vaishnava, some other kings were Shaivites. But generally speaking, most kings did not persecute other, other faiths. No. It, it didn't happen. It's it very, very rare. It, it didn't happen really. So we're, we're not saying that it never happened because there are extremes mm -hmm. can always be possible. But overall, there is nothing intrinsic which will lead to intolerance. And mm. see, when the when when even if you see, because of this ethos itself, right from the beginning of whatever record of history we have, when the Jews were persecuted, some of the early Jews came to India and they had they found sanctuary in India. Then even when, when the Middle East, uh, when the original people, the Parsis and others living in the Middle East, they, they felt persecuted because of Islamic expansionism over there. They came to India mm -hmm. and the Parsis mm -hmm. are a small but still a thriving community in India. And if you consider that way, uh, the Buddhists, when the Tibet fell to China, Buddhists came to India. The Lai Lama has a, a place in India and they are, they have been given right. a place. They are flourishing. So it's not just something which you're talking about at Yudhishthir's times. And it's not just limited to the, uh, to the forms of worship given in the Vedic tradition. You may say Buddhism or Sikhism or Parsi religion, they might not be in the Vedic tradition. But that mm -hmm. ethos was, was something which is, which is very much there in the tradition. So when I grew up, I grew up in a Hindu Brahmin family and my parents admitted me to a convent school. So I, I learned about Bible over there. 
and, mm -hmm. and I, I just, it was just natural for me the way I was nurtured and grew up that, yeah, this is another way to God. Exactly. It is not that, you know, that is something which is, uh, which is uh, aggressive against us and that mm. I'm, I have to choose between these. No, it was not there at all. So right. we could say what we call as, actually, it's not just religious tolerance. Because even the word religious tolerance in, in, implies something like you are a nuisance, but I'll tolerate you. Right. <laughs> that is the idea of tolerance, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you are a nuisance, but I will tolerate you. But mm -hmm. it, you could say it's more of religious acceptance that there are diverse mm -hmm. ways and there are diverse ways by which people can raise their consciousness. So this ethos is very much there within our tradition. Ekam sat vipra bahuda vidanti. The Rig Veda says that there is one truth which is known by many different names. So the idea of multiplicity of understandings of the ultimate, the multiplicity of approaches to the ultimate, that is very much there in the Vedic tradition. So in that mm -hmm. sense, if India is to let various faiths flourish, that is definitely been happening always. But today, secularism in India means something else. And that's where a big problem comes up. Mm. So overall, what happened is, I would say three things have happened. And somehow we Hindus in general, and I say that we, I'm not putting myself out of it. We have all been responsible for it in some way or the other, maybe out of our ignorance or our incompetence, that three things happened mm -hmm. which shifted secularism from, you could say, neutrality toward religion. The state is neutral right. towards various religions. From there, it has shifted towards partiality toward minority religions. And right. that could also be okay in some ways. I'll explain when it is okay and when it is not okay. But mm -hmm. it has even shifted further than that to antipathy toward the majority religion. Mm -hmm. So secularism, it doesn't, doesn't just mean neutrality towards all religions. It has come to mean right. partiality toward minority religions and antipathy mm -hmm. towards the mainstream religion. And that is right. why and this, this is the version of secularism which mm. many Hindus, especially many Hindu activists, feel highly worked up about. So, right. so, so simple examples for this. That I know in, in, U, in U, UK we have this Krishna Avanti school where the US right. UK government uh, actually funds mm -hmm. the education of the children. And India right. to start a Hindu school is incredibly difficult. It would and, be such a hoo-ha. <laughs> It would be a complete. No, no, uh, not just yes. Ruha, Not just not. No, you can start a Hindu school. The legal obstacles are so many. If you have a Hindu right. school, you have to, uh, to some extent, get a lot of permissions, and then you have to employ people from the minority religion. You have to admit minority religion students, and there are so many mm. legal loopholes that have been passed. But to start a Muslim school mm. or to start a Christian school, the problems are far lesser. The path is much easier. Mm. So I could go into the legalities of this, but this is very complicated. This is, this is, so many of the Hindu temples in India are actually controlled by the government. So the funds from the temples, the donations which come to people, come to the temples, it's they so go to the government. Yeah, this is outrageous. <laughs> this is outrageous. In fact, Prabhupada was, mm, so Prabhupada was very, very concerned about this. And that's why he tried mm. to administer, uh, create the administration of ISKCON in such a way that the government would not be able to take control of it. So wow. it doesn't do that for any any other religious organization. It doesn't do it for Muslim mosques and church, churches or anything else. How do they justify but, uh, this? There are just, yeah. Well, and there are. I could go into the history, but the thing is that two, three things. First is that uh, in the past, temples were sources of great wealth. Because people gave a lot mm -hmm. of charity and temples were sources of wealth. So, and relatively speaking, the places of worship in the minority religion are not that much centers of wealth. Now, there are different mm -hmm. understandings of this, but so what when India became independent and especially when India adopted socialist model, the idea was that we want to redistribute wealth to bring about greater mm -hmm. equality. But mm -hmm. how do we bring about greater equality? For that, we take the wealth from the wealthy and give it to the poor. Mm. Give it to the poor. So in doing this, they didn't designate churches and mosques as wealthy, but they designated temples as wealthy. 
because temples had a lot of money and then you know I, I, mm -hmm. these are this is one part of the story you could go there are many parts of that story but basically mm -hmm. that's what has happened so that's why secularism raises the ire of many hindus it's not that hindus right. want a, a want a st hindu state where no other faith will be allowed i don't think right. even the most uh, most right wing hindus really want that that's not the hindu ethos right. at all mm -hmm. Exactly. What they don't want is that Hindus in our own birthland are not allowed to practice their own faith properly, are not allowed mm. to are uh, have feel threatened. So, so mm. the thing is, it is I talked about two things. You know, there is favoring the minority religions and partiality towards the minority and antipathy towards the majority. So mm. sometimes this happens. Yes. Now, to some extent, favoring the minority could be understood. Because the minorities are weak, they may be threatened, they may be persecuted. So the minorities may need some additional facilities, additional support. So that is understandable. It is understandable, especially in the Western context. I would say in the Abrahamic religious context, because the whole religious ideology is this is the only way. This is the only way. So whichever main religion is there, most of the people in that religion they believe that this is the only way, and therefore they don't really have a good regard for other religions, minorities. Therefore, they need protection. But when Hinduism doesn't think that, it's not in the DNA of Hinduism itself. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So now let me nuance this point. When I say that other religions say that this is the only way, uh, Christianity or Islam, it's not that I'm in any way implying that all teachers of Islam or Christianity teach the same thing with the mm -hmm. same emphasis. And certainly not that no. all Muslims and Christians are intolerant. But that, that mm -hmm. sort of statements are found in their scriptures quite prominently. For sure. Overall, uh, yeah. Overall, there is a... Yeah, how they are understood and lived depends on their teachers and teachers and followers. But that kind mm -hmm. of statements had never been central to the Hindu ethos. So that's why even that uh, partiality towards the minority is not necessary. But mm -hmm. especially the antipathy towards the majority religion. Right. That is something to the matter of huge concern. You know, mm -hmm. I, I were, you know, I, I, in the whole entire Indian educational system, a student can study the entire education system and never come to know anything really about the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Bhagavad Gita. These are not just religious books; they are mm -hmm. books which have shaped Indian civilization. So they are right. a part of our literary legacy. So don't study these books as, uh, as uh, religious books. Study them as literary books. Study them as books which have influenced Indian society. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's a big subject. But my point I'm making is yeah. that secularism is not the problem. The way secularism has been implemented in India, where it has become antipathy toward the majority religion, that is the problem. That's, and that is the version I, of secularism I, which is being protested against. Right. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I just wanted to, I suppose, move on to the idea that how... Um, how can we, whether we're Vaishnavas, Shaivites, uh, any kind of Sanatan Dharma followers, how can we be united in in a way so that we don't become resentful? We should feel anger, like we had already discussed. We should feel anger. We should feel these emotions. And we've already you've talked about how we should gain clarity through Brahm Brahminical culture and uh, Shastra Dhyan, I suppose. But there there still seems to be a great divide within the Hindu community. There's many qu <laughs> quotes here. Uh, one, one, I'm going to actually show his, his comments because he keeps going on and on about it. Because, uh, you know, there is this idea. ISKCON only promotes Krishna consciousness and not Sanatana Dharma. And he might have a, have a point here that uh, there is some divisive mm. rhetoric within ISKCON. I've heard it even on one of your podcasts. Not, to, not you, but one of your guests. He's a, a, a white devotee. And he's like, Bhakti is not Hindu. Uh, or, or other such statements like we are not Hindu, the, 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 in, a, in, a, in an effort to uh, maybe be a little bit more nuanced about our philosophy that we believe in one God and, um, you know, so this one supreme reality, we tend to alienate ourselves from other Hindus. And on the other hand, we've got other groups that are doing similar, uh, spreading similar rhetoric. You know, the Sikhs are like, we're not Hindu. We, we do, you know, everybody's got their own thing going on. <laughs> But in terms of uniting, dhar uniting to protect dharma, I think whether you're Buddhist or Sikh or Jain or uh, ISKCON follower, I think 
that is something we would all be able to get behind to protect the moral and ethical values of a society to protect our god-given right to practice our religion i think most people will be able to stand up behind it so my point is how can we unite how can we stop this uh, is there hope okay uh, this divisive rhetoric oh yeah definitely definitely mm, see the two things i i said that uh, let me share a ppt when when as devotees sometimes we say that we are not hindus that is a particular statement which it has to be understood carefully if you don't understand mm. it carefully even not only those who are speaking it but those who are listening to it also mm. so uh, let me show share my screen here mm, okay mm, window yeah share mm. so here you let's make it full screen so basically uh, can you see me can you see my screen can, yeah yes i've shared okay. it yes so basically you know there is this idea that most people live the materialistic way that i am the body hmm? and the other x is a pendulum that is one extreme of the iron pendulum to identify i am myself with the body only but the other hmm. extreme is to say i am the soul and not the body at all so hmm. now that is also true at one level but if you see in the bhagavad gita in 213 krishna tells arjuna that you are the soul inside the body hmm? Hmm. but in the very next verse he refers to arjuna as kaunteya and bharata the son of kunti and right. the descendant of the bharata descendant of the king bharata so if he is not right. the body why is krishna talking about him in terms of the body his bodily designation Because, yes yeah but it's a it's a it's a functional identity which is important in its mm. own role so there is a fundamental identity that we are souls hmm? right but we have functional identity so all of us have functional identity so when i go to america i may be or i come to uk i may i may actually come to talk about our spirituality hmm. to say explain how we are souls but in the american immigration hmm. i can't say i am a soul i have to say i am an indian <laughs> and i show my indian passport <laughs> isn't right. it so <laughs> the functional yeah. identity is important so we can't mm. just dismiss the functional identity mm -hmm. so there is a functional identity and this fundamental identity so the idea is that the way to function is i remember that i am the soul but i also remember i am in the body presently and we act in harmony with our functional identity to come to harmony with our fundamental identity that means mm. i act according to i act as indian i act as, as a depend on my relationship I act as a son a sibling a relative mm. a friend whatever it is i act in harmony i act in the harmonic way in these relationships so that i ultimately mm. realize my fundamental identity so this same right. dynamic we could apply to hinduism so mm -hmm. we could say is krishna consciousness hinduism well no because krishna consciousness is transcendental but that is in sense of the fundamental reality hmm? mm -hmm. but the, so if we are going to put krishna consciousness within the religious categorization of the world are we going to put in islam or christianity obviously not mm -hmm. there is a religious category demographic classification in this world and mm -hmm. the functional identity is always shaped in terms of those those demographic classifications so just like at one level it is said that vrindavan is in the spiritual mm -hmm. world hmm? to vrindavan right. is actually the spiritual world and is in the spiritual world and to say that rindavan is a part of the material is actually a part of the material world is to yeah. see it with material vision is, to, is considered offensive which is okay but if you want to consider geographical divisions of the world we are not going to put rindavan in china or pakistan or bangladesh rindavan mm -hmm. within geographical divisions of india is in india so right. similarly hindu is uh, krishna consciousness is within hinduism you can say at one level is transcendental to hinduism but at another level it is very much within the hindu tradition so that right. functional identity we can we cannot dismiss it completely and shri mm -hmm. prabhupad for all his uh, shri prabhupad taught transcendental philosophy but at the same time prabhupad was also very practical so he was practical mm -hmm. in the sense that whenever uh, whenever devotees were threatened when their temples were threatened at that time prabhupad did at that time prabhupad would say that he would seek help from the government from influential politicians in india 
you would seek uh, help from patrons and then they would say that a hindu temple is being threatened the hindu devotees are being threatened so so mm -hmm. what happens is if we take only one side and obsess over it then it becomes a problem so mm -hmm. is iskon promoting only krishna consciousness and not sanatan dharma well yes and no yes iskon as the name says is it's international society for krishna consciousness so our mm -hmm. focus is on talking about krishna but right. does that mean we don't want people to come to the level of dharma does that mm -hmm. mean that we are going to condemn anybody who doesn't come to krishna consciousness right. no i know many friends uh, from my college days and thereafter now they they didn't really become devotees in our in the sense we use the mm -hmm. word but through mm -hmm. their interactions with me and with other devotees through the whom they interacted through me they have gained a greater appreciation of indian culture they have gained a greater appreciation of indian wisdom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they have evolved in their understanding of dharma so right. my understanding is like a pyramid pyramid means that wherever a person is the the vedic tradition offers people resources to rise up to rise up from right. there so we could mm -hmm. say that iskon is focusing on helping people come to krishna consciousness but if somebody is not ready to come to krishna consciousness right now that doesn't mean that we reject them or condemn them it only means yeah. that okay they can take the wisdom of the gita they can take the wisdom of the rama and mahabharat and apply it in their way and their mm -hmm. lives and raise their consciousness a little bit so prabhupada was appreciative of that now this is this is actually the purpose of krishna consciousness one of the purposes is to prabhupada gave many different purposes of the iskon one of them was to build temples for krishna and to help create a community around krishna but other was you could say a basic definition of dharma to correct mm -hmm. the imbalance between material and spiritual values and right. correcting that balance between material and spiritual values is dharma so mm -hmm. many of the life members who help prabhupad uh, the same life member who i talked about who was kshatriya standing with a gun he was actually a disciple initiated disciple of a prominent mayavadi guru Mm -hmm. but prabhupada did not prabhupada did mm -hmm. not have issues with that he was interested no. in in prabhupada the sadhu he wanted to serve and prabhupada engaged him in service so mm -hmm. prabhupada was expert enough to see the different people are coming from different backgrounds and for some people we focus on bhakti and with some people we focus on dharma and in that way we can connect to different people at different levels so sometimes if we if if no this person who has made this comment it could be mm -hmm. possible that they have met devotees who are focusing only on bhakti and they don't mm -hmm. really recognize that there are multiple levels so that might give the perception that you know we teach only krishna yeah. consciousness yes we do teach krishna consciousness yeah. but we also offer resources for raising consciousness and even if somebody right. doesn't want to raise their consciousness up to krishna well whatever wisdom whatever level they want to go up they are welcome yeah. so in that yeah. sense we're not you could say see there's a difference between being sectarian and being specifically devoted mm. sectarian would mean that this is the only way but specifically devoted right. is yes this is this is what we worship we are not going to deny that but some devotees if they impose that on others that is a problem That's their own immaturity. It has happened, unfortunately. Yeah. That's their immaturity. So I, 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 That's their immaturity. Yes. It's their own immaturity. It's, it's, the, it's a lack of understanding of how uh, accepting Krishna actually is. You know, the, the, the depth yes. of his teaching. Like we've been discussing this whole, uh, this whole talk, actually, that it is very mm. inclusive, very accepting. It's not just tolerating another perspective. It's actually accepting that people have different. Um, opinions it's yeah. i really liked what you said that dharma is a way to balance spiritual and material what did you say if you could repeat that please dharma is a way to balance to restore the imbalance between material and spiritual values to restore the imbalance between material and spiritual values okay so like earlier Because talked about I... clarity energy and apathy so mm -hmm. that is rajas and tamas when rajas and tamas become too much they they take control completely that's when a person goes towards dharma but some amount mm. of sattva is there then there is dharma right so before i move to okay. this point i just like to share one more point if you don't mind see what has mm. happened even within within is gone to some extent there is a 
there is a tendency to overemphasize philosophy. So mm. what happens is, if you see this, people have yeah. many different dimensions to them. There's a philosophical dimension, mm. there's a cultural dimension, there's a social dimension, there's a professional dimension, there's an intellectual dimension, there's a national dimension. People are multifaceted mm. beings. So exactly. we might say somebody might be somebody might be we say impersonalist. Somebody worships a particular devta. That is mm. one aspect of who they are. Hmm? Right. That is one aspect of who they are. But here you'll see what has happened is that that person has been reduced, or rather the philosophical aspect is so highlighted that the person is mm. labeled only according to their philosophy. Mm. So Prabhupada didn't do that. Prabhupada mm. saw people as multifaceted. There's a fascinating mm. incident which is uh, which uh, which happened in Prabhupada's life. So Shila, so Shila Prabhupada was in when he came to America for the first time, he was uh, he was hosted by one uh, Dr. Mishra of the yoga studio. He had a yoga studio and he happened to be Advaitic and mm. uh, they couldn't get along very well. He didn't let Prabhupada speak about Krishna and then Prabhupada went his separate way after some time. But the, uh, many decades, may, uh, almost uh, many years later, he this, uh, this Dr. Mishra came to meet Prabhupada mm. and then Prabhupada had lunch with him and they talked very nicely and then after that when he left some of the disciples of Shri Prabhupada asked Prabhupada I thought he was a he was a other way he was a Mayavadi so Prabhupada mm -hmm. said philosophically we argue like anything but culturally mm -hmm. we are friends right it's a profound statement philosophically we argue like anything but culturally we are friends so mm -hmm. Prabhupada could see this multi dimensions of people and in this context he said just because we have philosophical disagreements doesn't necessarily mean that I have to treat this person as an enemy. We are still friends. Mm. So, in this case, what happens is sometimes for us, you know, if we are going to be attacked by right-wing extremists uh, from particular religions, you know, they are not going to care whether we worship a Devata or we worship Krishna or we are personalists or impersonalists. Exactly. For them, we are all we are all whatever. Uh, we are all mm. people who are disbelievers. So mm. there are so there are times when the cultural difference is to be when philosophical difference is to be emphasized, and there mm. are times when the philosophical difference needs to be de-emphasized, and the cultural exactly. similarity needs to be emphasized. This is mm. where in the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had this teaching of achintya bheda bhed. So mm -hmm. bhed is difference. And abhed is non-difference. So there are times when we focus on philosophical bhed. That, mm -hmm. okay, this is your philosophy, this is my philosophy. This is specifically whom you worship, this is specifically I, who I worship. There are times mm -hmm. for the differentiation. But there is time, there are also times to focus on cultural abhed. Cultural abhed. Right. That culturally we are very similar. We all worship deities, we all worship, respect the Vedas, we all want to take care of cows. We all have our holy places in Bharat Varsha. So there is so much cultural right. abhed. When Srila Prabhupada was in Kolkata, at that time there was this big Durga Puja going on. Durga Puja was very big in Kolkata. Mm. Now many devotees mm. say this, this is just Devata worship. Mm. But when Prabhupada was asked about this Prabhupada, are, are, are these uh, De Durga worshippers better or are Christians who worship one God better? Now mm. Prabhupada said that, the, 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 the Devata worshippers are better because they are in the house of the Vedas. They are in the house of the Vedas. Now, I wouldn't absolutize wow. this answer. I wouldn't absolutize mm -hmm. because we also have to see what is individual consciousness. Again, Sattva Rajas Tamas yes. has to be considered. And you could mm -hmm. say that there could be some Christians who are Sattvic and there could be some Devata worshippers who are Rajasic. Or there could be some Christians and Muslims who could be Tamasic. And there could be Devata worshippers mm -hmm. who are Sattvic. So, individual nuancing has to be there. But my mm -hmm. understanding of what what Prabhupada was saying is that for the for somebody who is a worshipper of Durga, there are far lesser cultural and conceptual barriers for them to understand the highest dharma, for them to rise toward higher consciousness. On the other mm -hmm. hand, somebody who is outside the house of the Vedas, for them mm -hmm. to rise toward higher consciousness, it's possible, but at least for them to appreciate Krishna and Krishna consciousness is going to be quite difficult. So, yeah. so this is an example of Prabhupada not focusing on philosophical or theological differences, but looking at mm -hmm. cultural similarities and valuing the cultural proximity. 
So somehow, right. if we if we don't recognize that Prabhupada's approach was nuanced, the Vedic teachings are nuanced, and we take one thing and make it into everything. Okay, mm. you are you are considered God to be impersonal, or you worship this particular deity, I worship this particular deity. Well, okay, that is a matter of difference at a particular level. But when there are mm. big dangers, but we are all together in danger, then we have to come together. We have to mm -hmm. unite. So otherwise, it's like, you know, in, with respect to the, I think the uh, when the Holocaust came, there was a there's a um, European who wrote this poem. Poem, it's quite well known. You know, I says they came for the they came for the socialists, and I didn't I, I spoke nothing because I was not a socialist. Then they came from the trade unionists, and I spoke nothing because I was not a trade unionist. They came for the Jews and I spoke nothing because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and then there was no one left to speak for me. Wow. There's no one left to speak for me. So when there is a common danger, we can't just say that, mm -hmm. oh, we are not affected by it. We are affected and we need to have the focus on the abhed at that point. That culturally, we are very, very similar. And that's why mm -hmm. there's a shared common danger which we have to deal with united. Hmm. So presently, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. Well, go ahead. I just think uh, that's such a such a wonderful point that uh, you know, even for swarthy reasons, for selfish reasons, we must look towards unity. <laughs> it's just common sense yes. that if uh, we just have to learn how to get along, we need to learn how to uh, respect each other. And personally, I think dialogue dialogue is really really important. Communication having these kind of uh, conversations. And I'm looking towards, if anyone is willing to have a, you know, a deeper philosophical, spiritual, um, sattva guni uh, communication and, and, you know, conversation, please do comment. And we're very happy to include that. We're, because truly, samvad, you know, ha having mutually respectful conversations would really help us uh, unite. But I, if, if I may say that, what I'm finding personally as, as lacking amongst us Hindus is an actual crisis of faith and practice. Um, personally, if I look around towards Hindus, especially because I live in the UK, in the West, it is completely overridden with a materialistic, um, you know, goal. You know, we're Hindu on Navratri, Diwali, Shivratri, you know, on the certain days of the year, we become Hindu, we go to the temple, we may pray. But most of the time, there is actually no real spiritual practice. And therefore, when something like this happens, when dharma needs protection, it's hard to come together because there's no practice of dharma, like in one sense. There's no practice of this overall uh, sense of spirituality that um, I, can, I can see where there's a lacking for reason to join. Um, if yes, you could maybe... that is so true. I agree with you fully. The problem is, if we have no uh, roots, our personal roots in what Hinduism teaches and what Hinduism offers. Sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so then if right. we have no personal roots, no personal grounding in what Hinduism is teaching, then either mm. we don't care or mm. even if we care or even if we care, Actually, is your hmm. net going off? Because my uh, bandwidth is okay. I can hear you. Fine. I'm, I'm lo losing you in between. Anyway, Achha. I'll continue. So, so what happens is, uh, at one level, if we are, uh, if we are not really having some solid, some practice of dharma, of of grounding in dharma, some sadhana, some movement toward bhakti, mm. then what will happen is, mm. either we won't care. Or if we care, mm. then the defining identity, who is a Hindu? It is one who is lost. opposes Muslims. Huh. It, it becomes the opposite Yehi identity. identity. Who is a Hindu? Yeah. One who opposes Muslims. Cool. Then huh. that is a negative identity to have. That is not a healthy identity to have. Yes, exactly. if, if some Muslims are threatening us and we have to protect ourselves. But if, if somebody starts, if their whole idea is, I am a Hindu and what does Hindu Dharma mean? Or protected against from aggressions from certain people. Well, that is, that is mm. only one part. So mm. now, mm. now it is true in all religions 
that the committed followers are going to be relatively few. Now, there are, if you mm -hmm. consider Christians, Christianity doesn't even demand too much commitment. It's just like go to the church once a week and offer some prayers, mm -hmm. read your Bible. There is not such emphasis mm -hmm. on sadhana. But even mm -hmm. that much, not if all Christians practice that. So that is always going to be there. That in uh, that not everybody who is belonging to a particular religious denomination is going to be a committed practitioner. But mm -hmm. if at least there is some level of connection, so there's some level of connection by which they have appreciation. This is one thing which I have observed. Uh, quite inter mm -hmm. it's interesting that Indians, uh, when they are in India, often they don't care much for Indian culture, Indian religion, Indian traditions. They just want to do it well in do it well in life, advance their career. When they come to the West, mm -hmm. then also initially mm -hmm. they're involved in they want to further their career. Uh, but once mm -hmm. they have children, then they become very concerned. We want to. Mm. We don't want to. We want our values to be passed on to our children, and really that's the time when they start exploring. Okay, who can? Mm. Even I don't know these values. I can. Who can teach ah. these to them? Where, where are the way to teach them? So there are times when people will naturally evolve towards religion, towards a higher level of spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that we need to provide facilities at various levels for people to stay connected. So if somebody cannot do sadhana, give them opportunity to do some seva. As I talked about earlier about uh, about uh, Prabhupada, most of the life members who who helped Prabhupada, none of them became initiated devotees. None of them became mm -hmm. sadhakas in the technical sense of the word in which we use in ISKCON. But they did a lot of seva. So in one sense, we can have yes. multiple levels of connecting with people. And there are mm -hmm. some people who would very much want to say connect in terms of advocacy, connect in terms mm -hmm. of say like now what you are doing is uh, you know you are shaping uh, shaping minds and shaping hearts in a way that is more receptive toward dharma and bhakti you so are. nobody told you to do this um, we are all doing it in our own particular ways but in one sense uh, as a brahmachari that's what that's all that i am i have to, i am to meant to do but you have many other mm -hmm. things you are doing this and this is this is wonderful so actually what is important is that uh, that uh, somehow this uh, there is this in actually that mentality is more in the Abrahamic religion, the Masiha complex. The Masiha mm. complex is some Masiha will come and deliver us. That was there in Judaism, yeah. that is there in, in Christianity. Why but somehow it is there, yeah. in our tradition also it is there that that maybe some outstanding spiritual leader will come and change things. Some or mm. some extraordinary political leader will come and change things. <laughs> But then, we'll still okay. criticize. Biggest critici criti criticizers of Modi are Hindus. <laughs> anyway, it's very yeah. unfortunate. See, it's, it's, it's a, you know, everybody operates under constraints that we don't know about. So mm. under those constraints, what they are doing, why they are doing certain things, why they are not doing certain things. You know, we can't, from, from outside, it's difficult to judge. But each of us mm. can actually do our part. In, in protecting dharma, in understanding dharma, in sharing wisdom about dharma with others. So yes. if we can actually take that responsibility ourselves, there, is, there are so many resources to share. There are so many resources yes. which each of us, we can understand, we can appreciate, we can share with others. And there is, there is actually a lot that uh, we can, in, in ISKCON traditionally, we focus on distributing books. You know, distribute mm -hmm. books and attract people to get to read books. I would say in today's world, if we share good social media posts, not just mm -hmm. inflammatory posts about how bad these people are, but really posts mm -hmm. about which are sharing, sharing the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita, the wisdom of the Dharmic traditions, explaining how they address issues, address issues in a, in a deep, holistic way, then yes. there is so much goodwill that can be created. Is somehow... What has happened is uh, that, that Hinduism has influenced the West. But because Hindus Absolutely. were not advocating it, because Hindus were not advocating it, the influence has been divorced from Hinduism. See, exactly. yoga has become very popular in the West. Hmm. But yoga, how it is portrayed is, actually yoga has nothing to do with Hinduism. Nothing yoga came from the ancient uh. traditions. Uh, Yoga came from those ancient traditions before Hinduism evolved. 
so yoga oh is God. good but hindus mm. who worship who worship monkeys and elephants are ignorant they are foolish exactly. people they are foolish people so that if that this is because this doesn't wake us up yeah for such a no, powerful again, point a, because is this, what you're is, saying is this bad people yeah. go ahead yeah Well, no, you can, you can, you can, well, I was just saying. Yeah. I was just saying. If we don't do the advocacy ourselves, then somebody else will take the credit. I was just having this conversation exactly. today with a friend. I, if we are not going to stand up for ourselves, and sorry, are you there? we're having some technical glitch there hari krishna can you hear me i can hear you right so what i was saying is that if we we don't yeah. so uh, if you are not you're saying if you are not standing going to stand up for ourselves uh then then we should not be shocked and surprised when somebody else comes in and the minority start increasing you know we cannot be hurtful and resentful when when muslims who are following very staunchly they come in and kind of take over or the western uh, westerners come in and, and you know very soon will hear that uh, yoga is is a a western idea you know there's the bible's written in sanskrit very soon we'll listen we will hear that the actually sanskrit is a <laughs> western <laughs> creation you know if we don't take responsibility yeah. have you heard of the the bible written in sanskrit i i went to one sanskrit website and all of the words are uh, in sanskrit because they are taking it seriously So now this is this is a wake up call for me if any hindus are listening especially in the west that we cannot just be hindus on one day of the year or just to tick a box that yes my grandparents my ancestry is hindu but in reality we are not taking the time to do shastra dhyan to have some you know actual purification spiritual practice every day then we are going to lose it and it will be our fault true yeah see it's always uh how should i put it that it's always better to focus on uh what we can do right rather than what mm -hmm. others are doing wrong because right. if we focus on what others are doing wrong that is actually the Can't recipe for mental ill health not just mm. helplessness but mental ill health because what happens is oh this person is bad this person is bad this person is that this person is bad what is the end result of that just, i just start thinking the whole world is bad and i feel myself with negativity so it's mm -hmm. like a self pity party it doesn't help mm. anyone so yes there are people who are doing wrong things but mm -hmm. what can i do right right now what can i do mm. right and if each of us start then all of us are parts of krishna and when krishna tells mm. arjuna nimitta matram bhava savesachi be an instrument mm. for the divine to act in the world so the divine can act through each one of us and we all can yes. play our part so mm. our tradition as i said we have contributed a lot say for example now animal rights are a matter of big concern in the western world mm -hmm. and yes. although there could be some differentiation between veganism and vegetarianism but there are many similarities and the point is mm -hmm. that that concern was very much there in india india is the world's mm -hmm. uh, world's most vegetarian country but even mm -hmm. then somehow is see, see in the west turning vegetarian or vegan is considered cool but in india even now people think oh you want to become modern mm -hmm. you should start eating non veg so mm -hmm. It, it, actually in many ways uh, from what i read about the history in 1960 1970s it is prabhupad who was the first among the first people who actually actively started promoting a vegetarian diet exactly. before that in the west the idea was before that the idea was that if you have to be vegetarian then you will have to eat vegetables for the rest of your life there no <laughs> idea of vegetarian cuisines they should yeah. come to an iskon feast <laughs> <laughs> so prabhupada introduced that but what has happened is because of various reasons now we are not really in the we are got caught in the dialogue we are got in the controversy about veganism and veganism and where this whole movement i would say that this is in the west also there is rising of human consciousness happening mm. rising of human consciousness in terms of veganism and in many mm. ways the vedic theology the gita theology vedic theology 
is very much in harmony with that but we are not contributing in that direction we are not uh, we are, so yoga has affected the west animal rights is changing even environmental consciousness among the various religions of the world mm -hmm. the vedic tradition has the greatest to offer for uh, for environmental consciousness because the idea of nature bhumi devi earth is intrinsically mm -hmm. sacred for us mm -hmm. so anyway the po point i was going to make through this is that that if we stand up only when somebody hurts us and then we think that mm -hmm. we have to hurt them back then we will continue mm -hmm. to be po portrayed negatively in the media will be seen as reactionary yes. but right. if we stand yes. up to present the things that are good in our tradition we embody mm -hmm. them ourselves and then we share them with others mm -hmm. then then gradually what will happen is the shape the perception of the mainstream media or of people in general mm -hmm. about india will gradually change about exactly so, there are many good but things that come from advocate. india we can only advocate no, that we complete this point yes go ahead yes exactly there are many good things which come from india but indians don't practice it exactly so in the west yoga is very popular but how many indians practice yoga in the west mm. uh, even as i said vegan uh, vegan uh, animal rights consciousness all that is very common but how many indians mm. are involved in it so it's our own tradition others take it and then others take credit for it but if we represent exactly. it then then we can actually there is so much which not only just to create positive perception of hinduism but actually to make mm -hmm. a positive contribution to the world there is so much that our tradition exactly. offers so and taking ownership to, yeah, exactly yeah not just See, not ownership, just by not label, in the sense of think. yeah ownership not in the sense of possessiveness but ownership in the no. sense of responsibility yeah responsible sorry yeah, yeah meant that so yeah, self yeah, responsibility perfectly. Uh, so, so uh, there's so many questions happening here. I thought if you have time, Prabhu, do you have a little bit? I know you have to do another lecture soon. Uh, maybe we, we can have you back on. But should I take a few questions, or should we do it another day? There's still 250 people watching, so I thought. <laughs> oh, have I lost you? Yeah. I, can you? Just now you came me? back. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear anything. Oh. Yeah, I can hear okay. you now. Okay, I was just saying, should I take a few questions if you have some time? I know you're aware. Uh, yeah, I'm aware sure, that sure, you have please. to go soon. Okay. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, this is please. an interesting comment. I don't do prayer, but I'm a Gnostic, but I'm a Hindu. This I find very curious because obviously, you know, within we have a, a space for many different belief systems in the Hindu umbrella, but uh, this is something new for me. can we be nastik and be hindu at the same time <laughs> i don't okay. know if that's uh, reconcilable yeah. <laughs> that's an interesting <laughs> comment uh, you may say that we are broad minded but are we so broad minded to accept even those who are atheists well, that's a good question uh, my answer will be twofold that generally in the bhagavad gita there is an analysis based on the modes sattva rajas and tamas and then there is a analysis based on devotional orientation hmm? that is somebody believing in god is somebody worshiping god is somebody devoted to god mm -hmm. and both mm -hmm. those frames of analysis are given in the bhagavad gita hmm? mm -hmm. so now if somebody is born in a hindu family then you could say that generically or demographically they will be identified as hindus but they may mm -hmm. not necessarily inherit the beliefs of that particular faith so in that sense right. i say i am a hindu atheist so now mm. my, rather than saying whether it's possible to be a hindu and an atheist my question mm. would be different that when you say you are atheist you know what is your conception of the god that you are rejecting <laughs> because quite often when somebody says i am atheist like i say i was in i was in america in a college and said one student said i am atheist i said yeah okay So I asked the same question. I said, "What is the conception of God that you don't believe?" I, said, I don't believe in any God. No, but tell me, what is your conception of God that you say you don't believe in? She says, "I don't believe in a God who sends those who don't believe Him to hell." Mm. I said, "Even I don't believe in such a God." I said, "Even I, I don't believe in such a God." <laughs> wow! So, great, great. 
Yeah. So my understanding would Come be backwards. most people who are atheists, they are not mm. psych- philosophical atheists. I mean, there, there may be some, but they are more like you could say psychological atheists. That means they have had some negative Emotional. experiences, negative conceptions. Uh-huh. Emotionally, they have. A, you know, I was in Texas and I was going for a program. So in front of me, in front of there's a car driving, and in the car there the, there uh, there was a slogan at the uh, in the back of the car. It says, "Oh God, please save me from your preachers." <laughs> <laughs> oh God, please save <laughs> me from your preachers. Ah, uh, बिल्कुल ठीक है. So the idea is that if the if the preacher if the, no no if the preachers are always holier than thou. If they are condescending, mm. if they are Helen Brimstone speaking, I don't have anything to do with them. So, mm. that, so then please save me from such people. So my understanding is mm. most people who are atheistic, not all, most people who are atheistic, mm. they are because they have had some experience of of religion which is negative, of religious people who are negative. But mm. so when when somebody says I'm a Hindu atheist, then I would ask them, okay, what first is what is what is your idea of what is the God you are rejecting again, reacting against or rejecting, mm. and then. Address that conception of God, then ask them what is your conception of being a Hindu. When you say you are a Hindu, what do you mean by that? And then mm-hmm. we we will find that in the broad Krishna does talk about atheism uh, in the 16th chapter in a negative way, but he is not just talking about atheism at a psychological level. He says that atheism, which is also equated with that life is meaningless, that mm-hmm. there is no uh, overall purpose to life. That that sensual pleasure is everything in life. Well, not all atheists are also like that. So right. I would say, if you examine the atheism and Hinduism, what you mean by those, then we can find some way of uh, that even such a person has place within the broad Vedic, uh, Vedic, uh, you could say universe. Umbrella. Vedic, right. Us, I mean, umbrella. Yeah. Vedic umbrella. Right. Beautiful, beautiful answer. Because I have actually met certain atheists who are more compassionate, who who are more accepting and uh, intellectual, and have more sadhana, more spiritual practices in their life, even though they are atheists. So actually, we we need to really like the question that you're asking is so relevant. What is your concept of God? What do you know of God that you're rejecting? And what do we know of God that we are accepting? We don't want to be blind bhaktas either. If we have not picked up the the scriptures, whether you're Shaivite or you know Shakti Bhakta or whatever uh, Devi Bhakta, you have we picked up there the the scriptures that will tell us what is this thing we are worshiping? If we don't know, then we're just uh, we're two extremes of the same, you know, two sides of the same coin, uh, and and we can exactly. cause destruction in the same you know, way. And again, going cause... back to the earlier, sorry, just to address one point, your earlier point about. Uh, I talk about non-believers and uh, wrongdoers. So, yes, within the within the context of other religions, it's very difficult for them to accommodate. How can they be a good atheist? Atheist is a person who has rejected mm. God; they are condemned. But if you, if you consider in the Vedic in the Gita, there is two divisions: the division by the modes and division by one's devotional inclination. So, mm. our understanding is that somebody might be atheistic in terms of their spiritual temperament. But they may still have some mode of goodness within them. Maybe it is because of their upbringing. Mm. Maybe because of their actions in their previous life. So we can mm. fully re- appreciate the point that atheists can be sometimes good people, and sometimes religious mm. people can be terrible people also. So in the mm. there is a significant level of self criticality. That's essential. In the Bhagavatam, there is that you know that it says that bhakti can also be practiced by people in goodness, in passion, and in ignorance. So even bhakti mm. can be practiced in ignorance. So that yeah. self-criticality is there. So it's the, the point I'm making is it's not as black and white as some people think. You are atheist. You are out mm-hmm. of this Vedic umbrella. I'm atheist. I'm inside mm-hmm. the Vedic umbrella. No, there are many shades of gray in between. And sometimes, mm-hmm. in terms of behavior, a atheist might be better behaved than a theist who is who is not who is in the lower modes. So the mm-hmm. so the complexity of humanity. Is actually reflected in the Gita's analysis based on the three modes. A lot of shades of grey. Hmm. Very, really, really, yeah. So important. Uh, this person has been commenting again and again the same comments. So and I thought, who better to answer this question than you? Because um, 
<laughs> uh, but Shri Krishna's avatar of Bhagwan Vishnu, why does Iskon keep banging on about his and in, in different comments, he's saying that why does Krishna why does Iskon say Krishna is the source when clearly it's stated in some Puranas that he's the eighth avatar, you know, uh, isn't Vishnu the source? Why does okay. uh, why do we focus on Krishna? Yeah, so now <clears throat> Yeah, so now here is a very important principle to understand that how things are perceived, that is important. See, Vishnu is generally considered to be the one in charge of administration. So what does it mean administration in this case? That there are three devatas, it's Brahma, Vishnu and Mahesh. So hmm. the idea is that Brahma is in charge of creation. Vishnu is in charge of maintenance and Lord Shiva is in charge of destruction. So it's not that that means Lord Shiva is a bad person who is destroying, it's that each of these are universal functions and they need to be, they need to be done. So how are they done? They are done in a particular way by particular deity. So Lord, Vish, Lord Vishnu is the maintainer. So I'm sharing a PowerPoint slide about this to explain this answer. So what happens is that whenever uh, yeah, sorry. So, so whenever there is any problem in the world, whenever there is any problem in the world, at that time, from here, uh, people go to the administrator. So it's like mm -hmm. if there is any law and order issue, we will go to the we will go to the police police person, or we'll go to the mayor, or we'll go to the chief, chief minister, the prime minister, the head of state, the administrative head of state. Mm -hmm. So like that, whenever there are any problems in the universe, uh, the various various important people in the universe, they approach Vishnu. And then in response to that prayer to Vishnu, various avatars come. So it could be Ram, it could be Krishna, it could be Buddha, it could be Kalki, there are Dasha avatars, and there are many more avatars, only, not the Dasha. Hmm? Now having said this, what the Bhagavatam states is that God has multiple aspects. So there is God in office and there is God at home. And mm -hmm. normally you could say the Prime Minister is in office, is maybe a little more formal, the Prime Minister at home is a little more informal. But they are the same person. But uh, how, mm -hmm. uh, so similarly there is God at home and God in office. But the difference is that God, because he is God, he can be at two places, many places at the same time. So he is simultaneously mm -hmm. in office and he is simultaneously in home. And mm -hmm. the Bhagavatam explains that God in home is Krishna. That God in home is Krishna. So it is the same person. Krishna and Vishnu are the same person. Krishna is God in home. Vishnu is God in office. So mm. what happens is, because Vishnu is God in office, whenever any cosmic emergency is there, the request mm. always goes to Vishnu. And whichever mm. divine being comes, that beings come through Vishnu. So even when Krishna appears, the prayer goes to Vishnu. And then Krishna mm. appears. But that doesn't mean wow. Vishnu is the source of Krishna. What it means is that mm -hmm. Vishnu and Krishna both are co-eternal. However, <laughs> if, we, if we take from the previous slide's perspective, all the avatars are coming through Vishnu. Which is mm -hmm. true, which is not wrong. But if you consider mm -hmm. from this sorry, this perspective, what happens is that Vishnu and Krishna are the same person. But what mm -hmm. in, in terms of rasa, what in a god at home, so like a pra prime minister at home, will exhibit one's personality, the intimate side of one's personality much more. So mm -hmm. similarly, Krishna at home emphasizes or reveals his personal side much more. The multiplicity of his relationships. The rasa is much more. Vishnu doesn't have a father or a mother or a sibling. Krishna has all of those. So Krishna relishes many more relationships than Vishnu does. So in that sense, you could say Krishna is manifesting the personality of divinity more fully than Vishnu. So mm -hmm. in that sense, it can be said that Krishna is the source of Vishnu. But having said that, this is not a major issue. So again, I mentioned earlier about the Bhed and Abhed. So mm. if you have a pendulum over here, 
So one extreme could be that Vishnu and Krishna are entirely the same person in every way. Well, not exactly. This is focusing too much on the Abhed aspect, the other extreme. Hmm? Mm. So this is too much on the Abhed. They are not different entirely. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. other is that Vishnu and Krishna are completely different. And if we consider them completely different, then we may fight. So some even some Iskon devotees mm -hmm. may say that oh, Krishna is superior to Vishnu. And mm. some other Vishnu tradition, they may say Vishnu is superior to Krishna. But mm. if we understand that you know, these two are both extremes, Vishnu and Krishna mm. are one person with different personalities. Exactly. And both are the supreme person. And worshipping both of them can take us to the supreme. And mm. can take us to the supreme abode. That is like supreme perfection. So mm. this, wow. is a, this is a, actually, I would say, an excellent example of theological differences being made too big so that we have dissension and dispute over issues that are practically exactly. not very consequential for us. This is, you know, if you mm. worship, like, if you are attracted to Krishna and worship Vishnu, that's wonderful. If you are attracted to Krishna exactly. and worship Krishna, that's wonderful. So there's no need to wow. make it a big issue either this way or that way. Hmm, wonderful. That's such a beautiful uh, analogy, especially for me because, uh, you know, I absolutely love the Vishnu Sasranam. I listen to it every morning. You know, when you go to Balaji, you can feel the profound, uh, you know, uh, the spiritual energy. There's no question that, that this is not the Supreme Lord. And I really appreciate what you said, different personalities and different expression of rasa. So some, some, of, mm. some of his devotees enjoy this rasa of him as a young child or a young person. And some of them enjoy the rasa of this Aishwarya Bhav. So it, it is a matter of your own individuality and what, what you connect with, which is so beautiful that God allows that. <laughs> he allows this oh, uh, individuality. God welcomes that. God relishes that. Not just allows, yes. welcomes and relishes that. So I hope that answered your question, uh, Aditya Ji, because it, it is almost a mute point to discuss who is greater, Krishna or Vishnu. And, it, and if, if the only, he was saying that he went to his con temple and they said uh, Krishna is God, then he left. <laughs> you know, that's one of them. So yeah. it doesn't really, it, it, if, if that is the reason why you're not entering a, a place of worship for Krishna or Vishnu, then uh, maybe it, you need to re, we need to reassess our understanding. And I really appreciate that what you've just shared, that they're actually the same exact person. And the more we try to separate them, it's almost like that's our own problem. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Should yeah, I, rather should... than focusing on who is greater, hmm. yeah, rather than focusing on who is greater, it is better to focus on uh, uh, towards whom is my attraction greater. The point is not to talk who is greater. The point is to become attracted. That is what is going to transform us. The purpose right. of the Bhagavad Gita is not simply to proclaim God's position. Ultimately, it mm. is to transform our disposition, our heart. So, mm -hmm. whether we are attracted to Vishnu or Krishna, if we are attracted, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. so, wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to take one last question and I can't find it right now. But uh, somebody was saying that the only way forward now, coming back to this point about uh, protecting dharma, you know, how to build on our Kshatriya nature and the need of the hour as such, how to balance out our anger and reaction um, with, you were talking about Brahminical qualities. Somebody was saying, we must just, all the sannyasis should pick up weapons now. That's the only way forward. <laughs> I can't find it now, but because um, there's so many uh, comments. But uh, w is that an advisable way? Should Brahmanas pick up weapons do you, do you think that we should who is qualified to pick up a weapon i, I don't think we finished that thought oh, uh, okay when we were talking about kshatriyas yeah okay so who is qualified to pick up a weapon that's a very serious question my understanding is that uh, you know one who has a healthy fear of the power of weapons one who mm. has a healthy fear that has to be there, you know. Generally, if a person is a trained, uh, trained, uh, say, user of a rifle or a gun, you know, if they are really mm -hmm. trained to use it, they will themselves keep it very. If they have it in their home, also they will keep it very carefully, not let their children have access to it. Why? Mm -hmm. 
mm. because it has enormous destructive power so mm. not only we we recognize the destructive power but we recognize that we ourselves can also misuse it so it's a it has a healthy respect and even you could say not fear in the sense of paranoia but fear in the mm. sense of fear that brings caution it's like if i'm crossing a road i need to have a healthy fear of the traffic coming that doesn't mean i never cross the road it just means i am cautious so that first would be a healthy fear of the power of weapons that is required mm -hmm. you know if we don't have that we see this in the Mah mahabhagavatam ashwatthama uses a brahmastra without knowing how to control it and that brahmastra is about to destroy the whole world so in today's world we are also very very apprehensive that say nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction may fall in mm. the hands of some rogue states or some rogue actors and they can mm. cause untold devastation so just as mm -hmm. that is a valid exactly. fear so similarly for us also the first thing is that we need to be careful that we don't uh, we if anger is the cause for raising weapons i think that is a very dangerous thing because we that anger often makes us indiscriminate right. so yes mm -hmm. anger can be there but there is also there is the capacity to restrain the anger so that we are actually using the weapon constructively we're not not just destructively not just indiscriminately rather discerningly not indiscriminately so a healthy mm. fear of the power of weapons a healthy capacity to control one's anger that has to be there mm. and then beyond that of course we can say that, so these are all actually kshatriya values kshatriya values are that uh, kshatriya is not supposed to use weapons indiscriminately and if they use it indiscriminately that that actually cons is considered to be a deficiency in kshatriya so uh, some of us may have right. inclinations if we have inclinations in that direction we can learn some self defense we can use some weapons but you have to get careful mm. training and that's not just training in using the weapons but training in in learning to restrain ourselves to you regulate ourselves that we use it properly that's why right. if you see duryodhan was a brahmana sorry duryodhan was a kshatriya arjuna was a kshatriya but the difference is that duryodhan never listened to good advice and that's why his kshatriya nature got distorted and he caused a unnecessary devastating war hmm. now arjuna he was a kshatriya he was also heroic but he he would listen to good advice just before the war he turned to krishna for advice so i would say that capacity is a third point you know the kshatriyas have to be guided by good advice that means in the brahmanical mm. people need to have the guided not necessarily micro control by them the krishna in micro control arjuna about how he's going to fight the war but right he was overall guided in his purposes his values and purposes so wonderful yes if somebody feels inspired i don't think we can have by a Uh, any genealogical decision that who can be a kshatriya or not today the varanas are mm. very very nuanced so you just have to look at one's individual nature so it's a bigger question is that uh, how do we discern our nature do i have the nature to be a kshatriya my understanding is two things you know that is there is inner inner outer competence and inner inner comfort or confidence that mm. you know, how do i know if i am intellectual you know mm. I, I'm good, good at studying. I'm good at presenting. I'm good at analyzing. I, and it can be objectively mm. assessed. But internally, mm. I feel happy doing it. This is what I love mm. to do. This is what I look forward to do. So now, Kshatriya, yes. I would say, what we need in today's world is yes, we definitely need people who will use weapons. But Kshatriya is a holistic thing. If some yes. some people today can take up more responsible advocacy, advocacy of Hindu causes, that is also Kshatriya work. that is very much required mm -hmm. and that can help far more than because we live in a world which is still significantly civilized how often are we going to require the use of weapons mm -hmm. some places sometimes definitely but overall advocacy overall uh, doing uh, things in a strategic way by which we can we can help create a positive co contribution of dharma and a positive per perception of dharma so the other qualities of kshatriyas mm -hmm. are also important And there are many okay. facilities to do that in today's world. Yeah, I think we should have a podcast, Prabhu. If you if you would oblige one day about Varnashram and understanding our inner psychology, 
that that would be really I would really enjoy that if that would be possible. I'm going to yes, ask just one last one. question <laughs> because she's been yes, literally asking like a million times. Yeah. It's not related at all to this uh, to this talk today, but I'm going to if that's okay. It's about addiction, and I think I have no idea about K-pop anime and stuff, but my my children do play video games, and I can I can already see the uh, you know the pull the, this intense. Uh, pull towards just completely losing our consciousness into this world. So Snehaji, uh, she's been asking for a long time. I, I, Prabhu is the perfect person to answer this question about addiction. How shall we tackle addiction for, in the youth? So how to tackle addiction in the youth? That's tough. My understanding would be broadly uh three things first is that you know, if you consider any addictive desire it's not always like a very intense desire it's hmm. there are urges which we have so and those urges sometimes become very strong so i use the word that the urges have surges hmm. urges they just go up so sometimes when they go up at that time it is almost impossible to resist them at that time, don't define yourself by what happens when the surges come. Focus on mm -hmm. what you do between those surges. Because sometimes it may just be too strong. The surges may be so strong that it's almost impossible to resist it. So, okay, at that time I'm overcome. But what do I do after that? In, be if in, the in between time, I just beat myself up. Why did I do that? Why did I waste so much time? Why did I indulge in this? Well, mm. that could be very dangerous. That, that means we are simply weakening ourselves and next time the surge will come, it's going to be even worse. It's uh, uh, not, not necessarily worse, at least we will not be equipped in any way to deal with it. So, you know, mm. in some cases, some urges may have just become so strong due to past indulgence that at that time, resisting may be impossible. And if somebody we know or even we ourselves are suffering from that, don't see them as bad people or depraved people. See them as almost like having a disease. I'd like to share an image over here to illustrate mm. this point that see how, how addiction grows, any addictive desire goes. This, this is based on Bhagavad Gita 262-63. See, every desire that we indulge in, it's initially like a small, it's not even a snowball, it's a snow pebble. Hmm. We could just kick it and crack it and it will break apart. But as we indulge in it, it starts becoming bigger and mm -hmm. bigger. It starts becoming a snowball. And hmm. then it becomes a snow boulder. Hmm. And when it has become a snow boulder, at that time it knocks the person over. So, so now for some of us, <laughs> certain cravings might be at the first at that level of the the cravings might be at this level at indulgence so recognize mm. that they won't stay at that table I, I can control this i can mm. control this. some people say drink but don't get drunk well mm. it's possible but it's not always possible also we start doing it and mm. tomorrow we just go over it can happen with many things so if you understand this uh, the, the you could say the the analysis of how it grows so that same thing which you say i can control it maybe you can control it today but after some time, it will become this big a snow boulder, it will be impossible to control. So if we are mm. at this level, just best is to stop it. Don't think uh, I'll be able to control it. Just try to regulate yourself. But if you have come to this level in some things, then don't be too hard on yourself. If during the surges, we can't control ourselves. Then mm. at that time, focus all the energy between the surges. Rather than beating yourself up between the, uh, at that time, Beating yourself up, what I, why did I do that at that time? Focus on what can I do constructive during the intermediate time. And what can we do constructive wow. in the intermediate time? I'd say uh, the most important thing in that case is that another example I like to give is like a waves. You know, when waves come, they sweep us away. Mm -hmm. And if a huge wave has come, no matter how strong I may be, I cannot actually stop the wave or stop the wave from sweeping me away. But what we can do is, 
we can find an anchor so an anchor is something which which is good for us and which we feel good doing that mm. is our anchor so for example somebody likes to indulge they just you know surf a lot on social media watch this do this watch this video read this well what do you what do you like to do well maybe you know i like music okay and uh what okay is there some kind of music which is also good for me so if you can find that something which is both good for us and something which we feel good doing then mm. that can become our anchor so this is our anchor in the bhakti tradition it is called uddipan things we like to do and things that are good for us where is the intersection between the two where is the intersection mm. between the two so learn to find that and learn to hold on to that so if the urge to serve the net comes for me the urge to gossip comes in me i will not gossip i will not do this well saying that sometimes like the wave is coming and i'll not get swept away well don't say just don't get swept away find out an anchor okay i like to hear spiritual music or you know i like to recite shlok shlokas i like to hear some good wisdom i like to read some wisdom books so have that anchor ready have that anchor ready Mm. So when we have that anchor ready, then what? La- and we learn to so in between the urges, the so urges come. In between the urges, we find the anchor and learn to hold on to the anchor. And as our grip on our anchor will become stronger, then what will happen mm. in future? Even when the urges come, they will not sweep us away because we have learned to hold on to the anchor. Right. And the last thing that's is, the whole point of a sadhana. Sadhana, yes, exactly. That's a that's a. Uh, we do our japa, we hear kirtan, we do bhakti. That there can be many anchors, but bhakti mm. and connection with the divine provides us the strongest anchors. So, mm. so that's that's the second part. Uh, so, um, first is just be kind to yourself and focus, and then focus on the space between the surges. Second is strengthen the anchor, and third is try to have external supports for yourself. because sometimes it's not just a matter of our own will mm-hmm. sometimes you know depending too much on our own will is is not easy so one of the what krishna essentially says in 258 in the bhagavad gita is that the best way to deal with temptation or what i want have not the best, best the, um, a highly effective way to deal with temptation is to not deal with temptation that mm-hmm. means keep tempting th- keep tempting things mm-hmm. away and try to keep good constructive people around you so if we can have external mm-hmm. support that is a very big help and external support can be best wow. in terms of we have healthy relationships if we have somebody who can be like accountability partner for us who won't judge and condemn us but still who can say mm-hmm. you know i i did like this and i really don't want to do this then if we get the mm-hmm. urge we can talk with them and they can help us so quite often we surround ourselves with not external supports but external temptations or external threats external weakeners and mm. then we try to avoid the restrain or restrain ourselves that's almost impossible so mm. those three things you know uh, are, are a kind focus on our a kind focus on what we can do finding and holding on to our anchors and creating a supportive environment rather than a around us rather than a weakening or a tempting environment those are ways in which we can wow. and deal with addiction okay wonderful